Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. On February 21st, 1918, a bird named Incas died at the Cincinnati Zoo. Incas was a Carolina parakeet, and his mate, Lady Jane, had died the year before. They were the last of their species. In the 1990s, physician Robert Webster of Jasper, Georgia, coined a name for the last living member of a species, which was endling. It's a word he realized the need for while he was treating a patient who told him that she was the last living member of her family line. Endling isn't in Merriam-Webster or the Oxford English Dictionary as of when we are recording the show, but it's been picked up by museums and journals and magazines and their discussions of last animals, especially ones that people cared enough about to name and then write about them when they died. So a few other examples of these endlings are Booming Ben the Heath Hen, who was last seen on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, on March 11th, 1932. Benjamin, the last Tasmanian tiger, died on September 7th, 1936 at the Hobart Zoo in Tasmania. And some of these are really recent. Tuffy, who was the last known Rab's fringe-limbed tree frog, died on September 26, 2016 at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens Frog Pod Laboratory for Amphibian Conservation. So since we're coming up, On the centennial of its extinction, today we're going to talk about the Carolina parakeet along with two other endlings who were Martha the passenger pigeon and Lonesome George the Pinta Island tortoise. Just in case it's not clear, uh, this episode would get uh, the, I think they've changed the way they do these ratings, but it used to be at doesthedogdie.com. There would be a sad face of a dog. Yeah. If the dog died, this this would have like all sad faces. This whole episode is about animals dying. Yeah. Uh, once upon a time, Eastern North America had its own native parrot species, Conoropsis carolinensis better known as the Carolina parakeet, or sometimes the Carolina parrot. A subspecies, Conoropsis carolinensis ludovicianus, was sometimes known as the Louisiana parakeet. But in writings about them, they're generally grouped together just as the Carolina parakeet. It is not clear who coined the term Carolina parakeet, but it was sometime after the Carolina colony was chartered in 1663. The bird's first mentions in writing date back to the 1580s, obviously without the Carolina moniker as part of them. In 1612, William Strachey described them this way in The History of Travel into Virginia, Britannia. Quote, Parakeetos I have seen, many in the winter, and known diverse killed. Yet they be a fowl most swift of wing. Their wings and breasts are of a greenish color with forked tails. Their heads, some crimson, some yellow, some orange tawny. Very beautiful. You'll just have to imagine the 17th century spelling of that passage because it's delightful. <laughs> it is, and it's one of those great examples that reminds me of the episode we did about how language shifts and the rules are made up. Uh-huh. Because there's some fast and loose spelling that changes from mention to mention there, and I love it. <laughs> My favorite is that they are very B-E-A-U-T-Y-F-U-L-L. It's like the way little kids say beauty. Beautiful. Um, cute. Of course, North America's indigenous people already had their own names for these birds. And they're represented in indigenous art going back to prehistory, including in pipes and calcite and hematite ornaments. Their feathers and other parts were also used in native clothing and ornaments. Most sources describe the bird's range as covering almost all of the eastern United States. But research that was published in 2017 suggests that the Carolina and Louisiana subspecies really had smaller ranges that didn't really overlap each other very much. According to this research, Carolina parakeets lived all through Florida and then in coastal regions from Texas up to Virginia. Louisiana parakeets lived in the central part of the country in a squarish blob with the southwest corner in central Texas and the northeast corner in central Ohio. These were bright green birds, roughly 12 inches or 30 centimeters long. Juveniles were green all over, and as they matured, their heads turned yellow with little reddish-orange masks along their eyes, running down beside their beaks and across the tops of their heads. 
In the words of James Hall, writing in 1838, they were, quote, a bird of beautiful plumage, but very bad character. (laughs) But their character probably got a lot worse after the arrival of European colonists in North America. I really yearn to know what gave them bad care. Were they just sassy? Were they really obnoxious? Oh, we're going to talk about food? that. food? That's the next um, thing that we're talking about. I like it. It's like a far side cartoon, right? With like the birds from the wrong side of the tracks kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. In my head, that's how this plays out. Uh, Carolina parakeets ate fruit, plants, some insects, and a lot of seeds. And they were particularly fond of cocklebur seeds. So cockleburs are native to North America, but they're invasive in other parts of the world. And even in North America, these plants are annoying since they're covered in prickly, clinging seed pods. Cockleburs didn't really run rampant in pre-colonial forests, but once colonists started clearing those forests for farmlands, they thrived in the disturbed soil. The plants themselves could choke out crops and make them difficult to harvest, and the burrs could ruin sheep's wool and cause problems for other livestock. Cockleburr seeds contain a glucoside that's toxic to mammals, but Carolina parakeets love to grab one with a claw, eat the seeds out of the middle of it, and then drop the prickly part on the ground. Carolina parakeets' love of these seeds made them useful for cockleburr control and for control of the similarly annoying sand spur, which they also liked to eat. But European colonists also were planting orchards of fruit trees, and the parakeets treated these crops exactly the same way that they treated cockleburs. They grabbed the fruit with a foot, pecked the seeds out of it, and then threw the ruined fruit down on the ground. That is their bad character. They're litter bugs. They're wasteful. <laughs> I somehow feel guilty also joking about an extinct species. I don't, I'm going to put this away now. Uh, Carolina parakeets went after cultivated fields of corn and other grains as well, spoiling more food than they ate. John James Audubon described them as covering fields of stacked grain so completely that they looked like a bright carpet. On top of all this crop destruction, Carolina parakeets were highly social, gregarious birds that traveled in huge, noisy flocks and left lots of droppings behind. So a lot of colonists thought they were an enormous nuisance. Farmers hunted them aggressively to keep them away from crops, and people also hunted them for food and for their feathers. That very vibrant, beautiful plumage made them really popular among milliners. The birds' own behavior also made them easy targets. They congregated in large flocks, and they would fly off at the sound of gunfire. But then all the birds would return to the same spot, especially if they heard one of their own injured there. By the early 19th century, the Carolina parakeets' numbers were in obvious decline. John J. Audubon published his Birds of America in installments from 1827 to 1838. And in that book, he described the decline as recent. He said that they had been plentiful 25 years before. And this drop in population can't really be pinned on just one cause. In addition to the relentless hunting, the birds lost huge amounts of habitat through deforestation, especially after the cotton gin made cotton a profitable crop in the South. It's also possible that the birds were forced out of nesting sites after the introduction of honeybees to North America. There was never a formal study of these birds in the wild, so there is a bit of debate about whether they nested in hollow trees like honeybees do, or if they built nests out of sticks, or if they possibly did some of both. In the last few decades of their existence, Carolina parakeets were viewed as much less of a nuisance. Their numbers had dropped to the point that their control of cockleburrs outweighed their potential damage to crops. Farmers were more inclined to just let them be, which may have ultimately led to their extinction. We really don't know what tipped the scale from a reduced population to one that was actively dying out. But one theory is that Carolina parakeets contracted a viral disease from domesticated poultry, and that only would have been possible after they were allowed to hang around farms instead of being shot on sight. In 1904, the last known wild Carolina parakeet was killed in Okeechobee County, Florida. Carolina parakeets were easy to keep as pets, although they could not be trained to talk. Breeding pairs and small groups also lived in zoos on both sides of the Atlantic until the early 20th century, and they had been bred in captivity since 1877. There wasn't any sort of organized breeding program to try to repopulate the species or create a genetically diverse breeding pool. 
At the Cincinnati Zoo, Incas and Lady Jane produced several eggs, but they tended to throw them out of the nest, and they weren't retrieved or incubated. After Incas's death on February 21st, 1918, it took a while to confirm that the species really was extinct. The official determination came in 1939 following a National Audubon Society search of South Carolina after a purported sighting there. None of these reported sightings were ever substantiated, and a few of them turned out to be feral parrots or parakeets that had previously been somebody's pets and had wound up out in the wild. I grew up in North Carolina, and uh, I always, as a child, having heard about the Carolina parakeet, the fact that I was from North Carolina and that they were from North Carolina, and when the name Carolina parakeet meant that they were my personal species of parakeet, that was now extinct, and I was very put out about that. (laughs) Uh, And when Incas died, it was purportedly in the same cage where Martha, the last passenger pigeon, had also died. And we're going to talk about Martha and passenger pigeons in general after we first pause for a little sponsor break. Passenger pigeons, or Ectoscopes migratoris, uh, used to be the most common bird in what's now the United States. Their winter range stretched from eastern Canada down to Florida. It went all across the Mississippi River, covering more than half of the continent. Their breeding range was a smaller pocket, primarily around the Great Lakes and what's now New York. Male passenger pigeons were blue-gray with a rosy pink throat and chest. They were about 16 and a half inches, that's about 42 centimeters in length. And females were slightly smaller and not as distinctively colored. They were closer to brown-gray than blue-gray, and they had more subdued coloring on their throat and chest. They looked enough like mourning doves that this often led to cases of mistaken identity, although passenger pigeons were usually a couple of inches larger than mourning doves. They ate nuts, acorns, seeds, and berries, along with some worms and insects in the spring and summer. So when we say the most common bird... It's estimated that before European arrival in North America, there were between three and five billion of them. That is billion with a B, making up between 25 and 40 percent of all the birds in the places where they lived. They formed enormous colonies with up to a hundred nests in an individual tree. Sometimes so many birds would nest in a tree that branches would snap off of it or the tree itself would fall. In the 17th and 18th centuries, missionary Gabriel Sagard Teodat described their numbers as infinite multitudes. And Cotton Mather wrote about mile-wide flocks that took hours to pass overhead. Here's how John J. Audubon described a flock he saw in 1813. Quote, The air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting flakes of snow, and the continued buzz of the wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. An 1855 account from Columbus, Ohio, described the local response to the passing of an enormous pigeon flock. Quote, Children screamed and ran for home. Women gathered their long skirts and hurried for the shelter of stores. Horses bolted. A few people mumbled frightened words about the approach of the millennium, and several dropped onto their knees and prayed. According to this account, this flock's passage took two hours. There have been a number of remarks about, like, we don't have any kind of pictures or, I mean, obviously not video (laughs) quite at that point, um, showing how dramatic these flocks of birds were, but like the over and over they're described as literally blotting out the sun and just waiting for hours and hours as this massive flock of birds that blotted out the sun flew over and left droppings everywhere. Yeah, I I think the fact that people responded as though the apocalypse was nigh (laughs) is a pretty good indicator of how significant this bird flight was. Uh, this 1855 account is somewhat surprising because the passenger pigeon had a pretty similar trajectory to the Carolina parakeet, and by 1855, their numbers were noticeably declining. This decline came primarily from overhunting. Passenger pigeons formed such enormous flocks that they vastly outnumbered animal predators, so normal predation and even some hunting by humans wasn't enough to really reduce their numbers. 
But the passenger pigeon could not overcome industrialization and a rapidly increasing human population. In the 19th century, two technologies were a huge part of the end of the species, the telegraph and the railroad. The telegraph made it easy to send word of where passenger pigeons were roosting, and the railroad made it possible to ship huge barrels of pigeons around the country to use as a cheap source of meat. There were no conservation laws restricting how people hunted passenger pigeons or how many could be killed. So people hunted them at their nesting sites, and they killed massively unsustainable numbers in one go. One 1878 hunt in Michigan took 50,000 birds a day from their nesting site. As we said earlier, people had been noticing that the pigeon population was dropping as early as the 1850s. People were still hunting these pigeons in massive numbers decades after they noticed their decline. States began passing laws to try to protect the passenger pigeon, including outlawing hunting near their nesting areas, and in one case, closing the pigeon hunting season entirely. In 1900, President William McKinley signed the Lacey Act, which was the nation's first federal conservation law meant to protect fish and wildlife. One of the motivations for passing the Lacey Act was the plummeting stock of passenger pigeons, and it made it illegal to poach pigeons from one state with the intent of selling them in another. This was far too late for the passenger pigeon, though. By this point, some states where the birds had been widespread hadn't spotted one in years. The last confirmed sighting of a wild passenger pigeon was on March 24, 1900, in Pike County, Ohio, almost two months to the day before the passage of the Lacey Act. Ornithologists mounted organized searches, including offering up a reward of $1,500 to anyone who could find a passenger pigeon between 1909 and 1912, but none were found. By the 19-teens, the birds were extinct in the wild, and the only captive populations were in three zoos. The Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, the Milwaukee Zoo, and the Cincinnati Zoo. Attempts to set up a breeding program failed because the birds' highly social nature meant that they just didn't breed well in captivity. Martha, the last of the passenger pigeons, was born in the Brookfield Zoo and then donated to Cincinnati. She was named after Martha Washington. In her later years, her keepers had to keep lowering her perch as she became less able to fly, so they basically had to get it low enough that she could just climb up there. The last male passenger pigeon died at the zoo on July 10th, 1910, and then Martha died on September 1st, 1914, at the age of about 29. After her death, Martha was packed in a 300-pound block of ice and shipped to the Smithsonian by train. Taxidermist Nelson Wood mounted her remains, and her internal organs are part of the Smithsonian's wet collections. Martha is still part of the Smithsonian collection as well, although she is not usually on display because she is so delicate and very valuable. There's also a passenger pigeon memorial at the Cincinnati Zoo. Our last endling was also preserved through taxidermy. Couldn't confirm whether Incas was or not. And we will get to that last story after one more quick sponsor break. The Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador are famous for their diversity of plant and animal life with a lot of species that are unique to each individual island. Charles Darwin conducted research there during the second voyage aboard the HMS Beagle, which contributed to his theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Giant tortoises are one of the most famous animals found in the Galapagos. Galapago in Spanish means turtle. And there are 15 different species which fall into two primary categories, domed and saddlebacked. Pinta Island tortoises were saddleback tortoises with the shape of their shell allowing them to stretch their heads up to reach for food. This was also a form of communication among the tortoises. They would stretch their heads up as far as possible when settling disputes. These tortoises were, as their name suggests, found on Pinta Island. Penta Island is a shield volcano, and it's the northernmost island of the Galapagos. So for whalers who pass through the area, Penta Island was usually the first and last island they passed on their journey. From the 1700s to the 1900s, whalers hunted a lot of tortoises from Penta Island to use as food. 
And as was the case with the Carolina parakeet, the tortoise's own traits made them susceptible to this. Tortoises can live for an extended period without food or water. Whalers realized that this meant that they could capture live tortoises on the island and keep them alive on board their ships without a lot of effort, allowing them to have fresh tortoise meat in transit. It's hard to pinpoint how many tortoises were taken from Pinta Island alone, but it's estimated that more than 100,000 tortoises were killed in the Galapagos in the 18th and 19th centuries. By the early 20th century, researchers believed that the Pinta Island tortoise was already extinct. At that time, the island's ecosystem was in pretty good condition apart from the absence of tortoises. But in 1959, some fishermen released three goats onto the island, hoping to use them as a food supply when they passed through the area. As will surprise no one who has ever been around goats, they ran rampant over the island, they ate their way through a lot of the vegetation, and they produced lots and lots more goats. At that point, researchers concluded that if there had somehow been any tortoises left on Penta Island, the feral goats would have destroyed their habitat completely. And yet, in 1971, a Hungarian scientist who was on the island studying snails spotted a tortoise. The scientist's name, and apologies if this is a, a butchering job, was Jozef Vagvolji. And when he got back to port, he reported what he had seen. And a year later, Galapagos National Park Rangers went to the island to look for themselves. And there they found one tortoise. And they took him to the tortoise center on Santa Cruz to keep him safe. The American media later started calling him Lonesome George after TV comedian George Goebel, who had given himself that same nickname. For decades, they tried to find a breeding partner for Lonesome George. They tried pairing him with other tortoise species, including two female wolf volcano giant tortoises from Isabella Island. Later, DNA research re- revealed that Pinta Island tortoises might be more compatible with the Española tortoise. Two female Española tortoises from a breeding program were housed in George's corral, but none of the eggs that they produced were fertile. Lonesome George died on June 24th, 2012, and he was probably at least 100. And that sounds like quite old, but he was actually on the younger side for a Pinta Island tortoise. Uh, those tortoises could live to be up to 200, but the average age was more like around 150. And other than some weight gain, which is common among tortoises in captivity, he had been in good health, and his death was really unexpected. His unexpected death meant that his keepers were unprepared for preserving his body. The islands are remote, and the temperature was around 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 Celsius. They eventually secured enough plastic wrap to cover his entire body and a freezer to store him in. Lonesome George's remains were transported to the United States, where New Jersey taxidermist George Dante preserved them in a year-long $30,000 process that took 500 hours of labor to complete. George spent some time on display at the American Museum of Natural History before being returned to Ecuador. There was a little bit of a dispute between the researchers in the Galapagos and the uh, the government of Ecuador about where he should be kept once he was returned. The government's argument was that a lot more people would be able to see him on display in the capital of Quito. And they also argued that there wasn't a facility in the Galapagos Islands that could guarantee precise enough temperature and humidity control. I mean, after after an animal specimen is is preserved through taxidermy, like that doesn't mean it stops decaying for the rest of time, right? It's still it's still tissue that's going to have to be preserved. So there is a bronze statue of George at Puerto Ayora, Santa Cruz, and the Galapagos instead. In 1997, the Charles Darwin Foundation and the Galapagos National Park Service launched Project Isabella, which was a massive conservation project meant to restore several islands that had been damaged through the introduction of non-native plants and animals. And this included exterminating hundreds of thousands of feral goats. 
The work at Pinta Island started in 1999, and in 2003, the island was declared goat-free. Fortunately, it appears that none of the island's plant species became extinct during the goat infestation. In May of 2010, 39 sterilized adult tortoises were released on the island to continue the restoration process. So basically, they're there to serve the purpose that tortoises fulfill in that ecology, uh, but not to make more baby tortoises yet. <laughs> We're going to work on that part later. In 2015, a breeding program was announced to try to bring back the Pinta Island tortoise, or at least a tortoise that is 95% genetically similar. The starting point is a population of Isabella Island tortoises that had interbred with some Pinta Island tortoises that sailors threw overboard about 100 years ago. There has also been talk of cloning Lonesome George himself, although that has, of course, raised a number of ethical questions, along with concerns that people won't care about protecting endangered animal species if we just clone them later. We said at the top of the show, or at the top of this chapter of the show, that there were 15 species of tortoise in the Galapagos, but now there are only 10. Some of those species were only saved from extinction through very careful breeding programs and other conservation efforts. And although they used to live elsewhere in the world, giant tortoises are now found only in the Galapagos and in the Aldabra Atoll uh, in the Seychelles. Uh, do you have a little bit of listener mail for us? I do. I have two really short ones, and I'm going to read both of them. The first one is from Lauren, and Lauren says, I just listened to the Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike episode and wanted to write in since I grew up right outside the city. Unfortunately, I don't remember ever learning about the strike in our school curriculum, which is sad because there's so much history in the city that I never knew until I was older. However, the National Civil Rights Museum is based in Memphis, adjacent to the Lorraine Motel, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and I was lucky enough to tour it before moving away. It's a powerful, moving experience with exhibits that opened my eyes and deepened my empathy for the civil rights movement. I strongly encourage visitors to Memphis to go through the museum, especially if classes tend to only scratch the surface of the turmoil of the time. Thank you for telling these stories and broadening my horizons. Lauren. And then the other is from Sarah. Sarah says, I was excited to see the Memphis podcast in my queue since I grew up in a suburb of Memphis. As such, I had several school field trips to the historic Lorraine Motel, which is now the National Civil Rights Museum. Inside, there are some great exhibits, including a full-size garbage truck in the room talking about the sanitation strike. At the end of the museum, you're able to walk past the room where MLK Jr. stayed, and you can look out the window where there is a wreath hanging on the railing where he was shot. I was surprised that you didn't mention that the Lorraine Motel is now a museum. If you're ever in Memphis, I highly recommend going there even more than Graceland or Beale Street, especially when it comes to seeing an important part of history displayed in a historic place. Have a wonderful day, Sarah. Thank you, Lauren and Sarah. I originally had a lengthy discussion of that museum in the notes for the show. Uh, because there's a whole long arc about how when it went from a uh, hotel, it remained a hotel for a long time, and then the owners had financial difficulties. Long story short, then it was purchased and made into a museum. Uh, but because that episode was running long, uh, and I really wanted as much of the focus to stay on the strike and the striking workers themselves, that was one of the things that wound up being removed for the sake of time. So, yes, the Lorraine Motel that was the site of Martin Luther King's Jr.'s assassination is now um, a National Civil Rights Museum. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're a history podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash History. We're on Twitter at History. Our Instagram and our Pinterest are also at History. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts and on Google Play and anywhere else you want to get podcasts. You can subscribe to it there. And you can do all that and a whole lot more at our website, which is MissedInHistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 